Good morning, folks. How's everyone doing? Cool. Awesome. Uh, we've got a great talk. Uh, this is the Zen of Python Teams. Uh, please welcome Adrian Lowe. Hey, everyone. Can you all hear me OK? I am so excited to be here. I always like to start with a thank you, because it's such a pleasure and a privilege to get this stage. And I don't take it for granted. So thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you about the Zen of Python for Teams. But first, we need to talk about what the Zen of Python is. So let's do that. The Zen of Python is a collection of 19 guiding principles that have influenced the development of the language. And you can see them here. The lines are short and open to interpretation on purpose. Typically, they're taken as direction on how we should write our code. But they have plenty of guidance for us about how we should treat each other while we're writing that code. My argument is that not only has the Zen of Python influenced the design of the language, but that it's influenced the way we interact on our development teams. There's something uniquely Pythonic about Python teams, where we emphasize values of collaboration and transparency and trust. Reinterpreted for teams, the Zen of Python has plenty to tell us about communication and conflict, building inclusive and transparent processes, and promoting psychological safety. And today, I want to teach you about some of the attitudes, processes, and practices that can help you grow and be part of happier teams who deliver better software faster. Because delivering software to users in production is what we are here to do. I believe in shipping, and I remind my teams that that's what we're here to do. I love this quote from Intercom's VP of Engineering from his article, Shipping is Your Company's Heartbeat, and I recommend you read it. He reminds us that software only becomes valuable when we ship it to customers, and that good products are really a side effect of combining great people with an idea in an agile and dynamic and collaborative environment that helps them ship. Unfortunately, lots of managers forget that the healthy culture is critical to helping people ship. The Zen of Python has lots to say about healthy culture. So let's talk about how to build psychologically safe teams that ship, informed by the Zen of Python. Many of my stories will come from teams I currently manage, so let me tell you a little bit about us. I work as Director of Engineering at Juice Analytics, leading our operations and platform teams. We use Python and Django to build what is basically Squarespace for data stories. If you or your company has some interesting data that you want to share, our product, Juicebox, helps you tell an interactive story that your users can explore by asking and answering questions in a really delightful way. Python has been a big part of my life for most of the last decade. I've been an individual contributor on Python teams and open source projects, an organizer of Django Girls, an organizer of Python meetups, including PyATL, and a director at Django Project. So my stories come from pretty varied work, from my work as an IC, as a volunteer on open source projects, but most recently as director of engineering. No matter where I've been, or what I've worked on, or who I've worked with, I've always valued working on a healthy team. So now, as an engineering manager and director, I ask myself every day, how can I create a better experience for the people on my team? How can I help them feel safe and challenged so that we can ship valuable code to users together? How can I help them feel more connected or empowered or successful? What actions can I take to encourage that? So this talk is about the action that we can take, inspired by the Zen of Python, to improve our teams. As you hear me share my team's stories, I hope you'll compare it against your own experience. Think of the way the Zen has shaped you and your teams. Ask yourself, which of the sayings stick with you? Do any of them confuse you? Do you find any of them challenging? And why? When you leave PyCon and go back to your teams, what will you bring with you? So here's our roadmap for today. First, I'm going to introduce you to the Zen of Python. Maybe you haven't seen it in a while. Maybe you've never seen it. So let's start by taking a look. Second, we'll walk through just six of the Zen's famous lines and interpret them for teams. 
I'll often start by giving an interpretation as it relates to code, but mostly I'll fit, focus on reading it anew and applying it to teams and team dynamics. Third and finally, I'll wrap up with a call to action to take your reflections back to your team. It's fun, it's interactive, it's my own little Easter egg that I'm excited to share with you. So let's take a look at the Zen of Python. Here's where it all began, actually. The Zen of Python got started, like many great ideas, in a conversation on a mailing list. As you probably can't actually read from your seat, uh, the author Tim Peters playfully offered up the 19 lines as an outline that Guido could start from. The Zen of Python is technically 20 lines, with the final line left blank for Guido to fill in. I really like how Tim used the word outline and the phrase start from. From the beginning, he emphasized how this is not complete, how it's a work in progress. By its very nature and from the very beginning, it's an invitation to interpretation. So we should feel really good about coming up with our own interpretations today. It's totally in the spirit. And the spirit is joyful and playful and fun. Let's take a look at the lines. I won't read these aloud, but please take a moment to read over them. So the Zen of Python came to us from this humble beginning on a mailing list to being incorporated as part of the Python enhancement proposals as PEP20 to being printed on the back of our PyCon shirt two years ago. It's seemingly everywhere, and it's also right here with you, baked into your interpreter as an Easter egg. That's right, as long as you're running Python, you can run import this, and nope, nope, wrong cue. And read the Zen of Python, <laughs> give it a try. That's not the type of manager I am. I am not a snap and pointer, just for the record, but that would have totally spoiled what we were trying to do. The word is, here's your cue. So now that we've seen the Zen, let's step through six of the lines and interpret them for teams. Let's start at the beginning with beautiful is better than ugly. So, okay, the Zen of Python totally comes out swinging with this one. It's a hard one. And it's hard because words like beautiful and ugly are tricky because we implicitly understand how subjective and contextual they are, right? They require context to make meaning. And even when we have that context, we can totally still argue about it. One person's clean code is another person's cave painting, and some people think clean code isn't even a thing, and we should stop saying that phrase. When I was little, the word ugly didn't just mean aesthetically displeasing. It was actually used to describe behavior, as in ugly behavior, as in acting ugly. Acting ugly meant misbehaving, but a special kind of misbehaving usually directed towards adults, usually connotating disrespect. You need a little context with parents and kids, possibly in the southern U.S., to wrap your head around the idea of acting ugly. But if you'll grant me the idea that we can act ugly, then we can ask, what kind of behavior is ugly on our development teams? What have you personally seen done on your dev teams that has put your group two steps back? I have a few ideas of some things I've seen. How about hoarding information? That's when someone knows something helpful that they could share, but they choose not to. It defeats the purpose of collaboration and growing together when we hoard valuable information that could be used to help others. Or how about bitter, cutting code reviews? Has anyone in this room ever been subject to a bitter or cutting code review that seemed designed just to cut you down and make you feel bad? That's horrible, and I'm sorry that was your experience, because that should not be the goal of a code review. It should be to critique the code, not the person. Or how about if somebody wants to get started on your project, but there's no information about how to get started? There's no readme, there's no docs, there's no one to ask for help. There's nobody who wants to help. So let's break this down just a little bit more. To help interpret this line for teams, I want to introduce you to Ron Westrom's typology of organizational cultures. 
Westrom wrote a paper in 1988 where he identified three types of leadership styles that give rise to different types of team culture and communication. He'd been researching human factors in system safety, particularly in the context of accidents in technological domains that were highly complex and risky, such as aviation and healthcare. So, big deal. His types are patholog pathological, bureaucratic, and generative. Your team's type will be reflected in its leadership, the way it approaches problems and conflict, and the way communication flows or does not flow in your organization. On pathological teams, information is viewed as a personal resource to be used in political power struggles. These power-oriented organizations are characterized by large amounts of fear and threat. People often hoard information or withhold it for political reasons or distort it to make themselves look better. These environments discourage taking responsibility because people are scared. Sounds pretty ugly to me. On bureaucratic teams, in contrast, alignment with one's team takes precedence over alignment with the larger mission. In other words, individuals feel more loyalty toward their immediate team or group than they do toward their company and its goals. They protect departments. There's an idea that they want to maintain their turf. They insist on their own rules. They want things to be done by the book, but by their book. It sounds imperious. It sounds authoritarian, and when you're working on teams, it is not a good look. Some might call it ugly. On generative teams, in contrast, and this is what you want, the leader emphasizes the company's mission and they rally people around that mission. They ask, how can we accomplish our goal? And they think of we expansively. Generative teams have high cooperation. People feel like they can take risks because the risks will be shared and they won't be scapegoated. Failure leads to inquiry, not blaming or scapegoating or root cause analysis, and information flows more freely as a result. I think we found something beautiful. Westrom noted that leaders set the tone for their team, but we're all still responsible for our own actions, so ask yourself, what kind of team do you want to be on? We could debate beautiful code all day. Thankfully, kind behavior is a lot more clear. Being explicitly welcoming and sharing information freely, providing support and making it safe to ask questions, challenging code, not people, are just a few of the hallmarks of a healthy team. For more on Westrom's model, as well as other technical and leadership capabilities that will help your team ship, I highly recommend Nicole Forsgren's book, Accelerate. It's been a huge help to me, but let's get back to the Zen of Python and our second line today. Explicit is better than implicit makes me think of how important documentation is. Healthy teams document their processes and expectations and offer how-tos. They provide playbooks and resources and onboarding guides and tutorials. They make it clear how to contribute and what steps to take and what to do when you're confused. They do this because documenting your processes makes it easier for others to join you. Now, without good docs, people who already know each other can mostly muddle through. This is because they are cheating and they're leaning on existing relationships that they already have to get unblocked and get their questions answered. But what if you're a new person? You don't have that shared context. You don't know the back channel. So we need to document our processes in order to make it more accessible to people who don't look like us or who aren't already part of our group. Along with public docs, it's also important to keep conversation in the open. Keeping your chat about your code in a public place is another way to lower the barrier to entry. If you use Slack or a similar tool, this means keeping your conversation about your work in the main channels and not buried in DMs or other obscure places. Keeping the conversation op open makes it, as we see here in this example, uh, possible for anyone to uh, check it out and jump in or help if somebody has questions. And while Slack is not documentation, keeping your chats in the open does create something of a public record that is somewhat searchable depending on how you feel about the Slack search feature. All shade. <laughs> so 
So documenting your processes also improves relationships between teams, and this is part of my team. Healthy teams lead off conflict by setting ground rules and SLAs, or service level agreements, that define how they'll work with other teams. On our team, one of our values is consistency of process. We have several types of SLAs with our customers, both internal and external, where we try to be crystal clear about how work will get done, and on what timeline, and who will work it. Before we wrote these SLAs, our inner team relationships were pretty strained. But once we took the time to document our processes and expectations, we found we had way less conflict and more mutual understanding of what it was going to take to get the work done. This meant fewer fire drills, fewer last minute requests, fewer people paged on the weekend for work that should have been planned. We also publish our processes. Here's a snippet of our calendar, my calendar actually. Um, that shows how we uh, show when our sprints are going to happen and when we're going to be doing our sprint planning and demos. And we invite other people not on our team into our processes as observers, as listeners, and we share our documents and artifacts afterwards. We also document our people. Recently, I put a call on Twitter to ask about y'all's favorite lines, and I, I really like this response from Lee. And Lee refers to code in this example, but I think we can do this with people too. On my team, I led us in an activity where we created individual profiles to share on our team. The profiles answer some of the following questions, and I ask that my people refer to these periodically, especially before working closely with others, because the doc explicitly reminds us uh, how our colleagues know that they'll feel successful and what might cause them to stumble. It was a really fun activity. I just gave a whole talk on the process um, at Lead Dev this past Tuesday, um, and the video will be posted soon, so definitely check that out. A lot of people really, really loved it, um, and I hope you get a lot out of it as well. Um, because you're going to learn how to get answers like these, and these are real responses from my developers. Um, I hope that you can already see as you're reading how valuable uh, these answers are, and there's so much more that came out of that process. So let's move on to the next line of the Zen of Python. Simple is better than complex. We build complicated features and solve complex requirements with sets of smaller, more straightforward features, right? That's how it works. And we build meaningful relationships the same way. We work through tough issues by building a foundation of small interactions that build emotional bank account or trust with each other. So make sure that you're taking the time to have coffee with your colleagues or catch up on the weekend or ask about each other. Show that you care personally. You don't have to be a manager to do that. On our team, we're mostly remote, so we do something called remote happy hour, which is just where we meet uh, and hang out, just kind of chat about our lives. And for some people, it might feel tempting to skip a meeting like this because you don't see the immediate value in the way that you might, uh, say, spending some time debugging some code. But you're building that trust and familiarity with your colleagues when you do this. You're, you're building that shared language and the good feelings that you can lean on in times when times get tough. Because things will get tough. Here's the thing about real work. It's messy. And it's messiness and pressure and ambiguity is frustrating and hard and painful and disappointing. And it can take a real toll on relationships unless they're strong. And we can make them strong by investing in them. So let's build that emotional bank account so, that, so we're ready when the real world comes to make withdrawals, when deadlines and stress and team conflict threaten to take its toll. Our relationships with each other are the most complex and complicated features of our lives. Like software, let's build them with small but meaningful actions that show that we care and we're here and we're invested. When I asked my team which line of the Zen of Python they like best, one of my ops engineers said this one. Makes sense, right? He's a good ops engineer. If something goes wrong, people want to know. David loves this line because, as he says, if something is wrong with my code, I want to know. Interestingly, that very same week, in another conversation with a different developer, the developer said, if I do something to hurt someone, I want to know. With code, we can write more code to raise and log errors, but with humans, we have to rely on other humans to tell us when we broke them. 
and feedback is the tool that we have to help others understand the impact that they have on us. We owe it to ourselves and to each other to give timely, actionable feedback that describes what happened and the impact that it had on us. On a healthy team, if someone screws up, they shouldn't feel like they need to hide it or from it. We understand that people make mistakes and feelings get hurt, but we value each other enough to take responsibility for our actions and try to improve. We don't let issues pass silently because we know that letting things pass silently damages trust on our teams. The pain of giving or receiving negative personal feedback is only painful in the moment, but it's fleeting. Allowing it to pass silently is something that can accrue in damaged teams permanently. The other day, I tweeted about how to respond when you wake up to a wall of text from one of your developers who's like, oh my goodness, I broke this thing, I fixed this thing, but I feel terrible about it. Basically, they were feeling shame for making a mistake, and we've all been there. But mistakes are normal. And I said that you should respond to things like that by hearing them and affirming them and appreciating them and reminding them that mistakes help us grow. I was careful about the way I responded because I love working on a team where we can be open with each other about our mistakes. It's a signal that your team is on the right track if they can talk about their mistakes. If they're hiding, if they're yelling at you, don't touch my garbage, that can indicate that, like this possum, they're scared. <laughs> but if they come right up to your door and they say, look at my trash, look at this beautiful trash that I have amassed, that can indicate that they trust you, right? That they're not scared. So be kind to people who show you their trash. It was probably hard for them. And let's show enough of our trash that we get so used to showing our trash that it becomes something that we enjoy doing. It gets easier for us the more we do it. So let's move on to the next line. In the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. When it comes to code, refuse the temptation to guess at someone's motives. Don't get blame and stew about it. You're only going to cause yourself more frustration. When you see code or behavior that frustrates you, don't assume the worst, and certainly don't assume that that person is actively attacking you. Humans are complex, and their actions are influenced by all kinds of ideas and experience and trade-offs that you may never understand or have access to. So grab some time with them if you can, and care enough to ask. Ask where they're coming from. Ask what they were trying to accomplish and why they took that particular strategy. And if you can't reach out to that person for whatever reason, try to get some context from someone who might be able to help you. Put the questions on the PR, open a GitHub issue, address it, confront it, be assertive, challenge directly while caring personally. Refuse the temptation to guess. I really love this reflection from my lead, Megna, on why this is one of her favorite lines, and I think it works for people too. It can be really tempting, sadly, to explain away people, like uh, we might say, well, she's in, she's in sales, she probably doesn't care how the code works. Um, and while it can be tempting to explain away people like this, I've found that if you set really clear expectations and give clear guidance and have good docs that show that you care and make it safe to fail, people will typically exceed any expectations you ever could have had for them. And one final note for the managers in the room. Do I have any managers in the room? Awesome. I really tried to keep manager-specific advice to a minimum in this talk, but this one's for you, and I think it's important, so I'm going to call it out. Your weekly one-on-one -on -one -on -one time is your time to beat the guessing game. Please don't guess about how your direct reports are doing or what they're struggling with. Use the time you already have scheduled to ask good questions about what's really motivating them, what's frustrating them, and how they'd like to grow. Please don't guess. If you'd like advice on how to have better one-on-ones, I have another lead dev talk that I gave last year that's already available online. OK, it's time for the last line of the Zen that we're going to focus on today. And what better time where the line is? Now is better than ever. 
One of my developers, Steven, shared this wisdom with me. He said, it's really easy for me to overthink my work. Sometimes in the process of trying to figure out what would be the most efficient thing to do with my code, I can end up being vastly inefficient. Now is better than never reminds us of the value of taking some action, however small, to move closer to our goal. It's oriented toward doing, because doing, even if we end up being wrong, gives us information. When I was a developer, I had a single sticky note on my monitor. It's something that my EM said to me in a time when I was being really hard on myself. Doing and being wrong is a lot better than not doing at all. And he gave me this wisdom in a time when I was being really hard on myself, and he saw that that, that was holding, holding me back. He wanted me to feel safe to try things, even if it meant screwing up and breaking stuff. It helped me through some really hard times as a developer, and now I pass it on to my engineers as a manager. And there comes a time in my relationship with each of my direct reports, no matter how senior they are, when I have to share this sticky note wisdom with them. I share it when I feel like they need it. Sometimes they're being too hard on themselves like I was. Sometimes they're just having a hard time getting started. But it doesn't matter how many years they've been working as a developer or how much they know about Python. They all benefit from this at some point. That's because everyone benefits from being reminded that they can start where they are. On a psychologically safe team, people feel safe to make mistakes because they understand it's part of growth. So there you have it. Six sayings from the Zen of Python interpreted for teams. I hope it's been useful for you. I hope you've been thinking about the teams you're a part of and how you'd like to improve them and how the Zen inspires you personally. Because if you have been thinking about these things, then you're ready for the third and final section of my talk, the Easter egg. Volunteers, this is your cue. Yes, the Easter egg. The Zen of Python is an Easter egg, so it just made sense that my talk would have an Easter egg as well, right? PyCon volunteers are now coming around the room with something special for you. Thank you, PyCon volunteers. It's an egg, but what are we going to do with these eggs? Well, we know that the Zen of Python is itself an Easter egg, and we also know that the final line is as yet unwritten. And we remember that the Zen of Python started as an invitation to interpretation. And finally, we remember that Tim Peters left the last line of the Zen of Python blank for Guido to fill in. Well, here you go, Guido. We're going to help you out. Hashtag here you go, Guido. Inside the egg, you're going to find some directions. Write a phrase that you would like to bring back to your team. Write something that you want to be reminded of, something that you would stick on your monitor, or something that you would tell someone new on your team, or someone new to development. Write the 20th line of the Zen of Python, and then share it. Post it on Twitter with the hashtag, and the hashtag ZOP20. Ta tag me too, I'm Adrian Friend, I'll probably retweet you. <laughs> Take a picture and drop it in your team's Slack channel. Take your wisdom back to your teams. I'm really excited to read what you've been dreaming about and what's challenging you and how you want to grow. I'm thrilled for the teams that you're part of. Thank you again. Long live the Zen. Long live Python. <laughs>